When I first came to Bahrain, I was hoping to discover the customs of the Middle East, and this has turned out to be a very difficult thing, as people who come to the Gulf discover very early on. You find yourself surrounded by many foreigners of many different nationalities and faiths. They're all here to work, to achieve things for themselves. And this isn't what we expect to come for. This is not the, uh, the culture that we're expecting to find. So for some time, Islam is uh, obscured or masked from the people that come to the Gulf. So for a long time, I didn't discover anything about Islam. I heard the Adan, and I thought, this is very beautiful, what do these words mean, and people told me. But even so, this was just information. This was almost like tourism. It was, in fact, probably 10 years later, after I traveled from Bahrain to Sharjah to Dubai, and then on to Turkey, where I discovered something different. That's not to say that Islam is better or greater in Turkey. Uh, not at all. In fact, uh, sadly, Islam is suppressed in Turkey in many ways. I discovered after my arrival in Turkey that there were some wonderful things to find out about that country. Of course, it has a, a great Islamic history, and this was sort of struck me visually straight away. I immediately discovered the beautiful Islamic architecture from the Ottoman period. And it was only after some time in Turkey I started to get to know the people very well. We came to Ramadan, something which I'd witnessed many times before in the Gulf, but something which I just had let it pass me by, as most Westerners do. Just an annoyance, uh, an inability to get a cup of tea during the day. In Turkey, I felt something different. I felt some sense of something else. And uh, I soon noticed that the people who were fasting in Ramadan were the people who I'd already decided that I liked. There was a, a, an obvious correlation between uh, the best of the people and the people who fasted. These proved to be the best of the Muslims, and I was attracted to them. So I joined in. I did a, what seemed like a strange thing. I started to fast in Ramadan, even though I was not a Muslim. And I found this very, uh, very pleasing in many ways, quite challenging in other ways, but, uh, but very, very pleasing. Uh, and I enjoyed the fast. I enjoyed especially the few moments before the Adan of Maghrib and uh, waiting quietly with the people that have been fasting all day, working right through the day. Uh, because in Turkey, there's no allowance made for, for Ramadan in the work. So people are fasting completely from, from, uh, from the beginning of the day until dusk, and they're working all the time. And I did this also. And this is difficult, but alhamdulillah, we succeeded. And I was impressed with this, and this gave me a feeling of achievement, and it inspired me to do more studying, and around this time, somebody gave me my first Quran. Uh, it was a Yusuf Ali translation, and I was able to read it in the English and to understand something. And I was amazed when I read it that there was nothing strange in this book. I'd expected it to be full of, I don't know, Eastern mysticism, whatever nonsense you like to think that, uh, as Westerners, we imagine. There was nothing odd in it. In fact, what I discovered was it wasn't like the Bible. I'd never been able to understand the Bible. The Bible seemed to me to be full of contradictions, peculiar stories that didn't seem to add up, and things which didn't seem to convey the message of Christ. Uh, the message of Jesus didn't seem to come through in the Bible, except in some parts. Later, I've studied this more closely, and I now understand why, but that's not the subject now. The point was that the Quran made complete sense. So I read it, and this inspired me to read more, I read the biography of the Rasul and uh, the life of Prophet Muhammad وسلم, and this inspired me also. This was also very, very interesting. Clearly, this was a great man in history. So this was facts, something that I could relate to as a Westerner, interested in, in logic. And uh, I've, I followed this. And I continued to follow it, but still nobody was doing any serious dawah to me. Nobody was trying to convince me that I should change my ways in any other way. So I became, if you like, uh, an abstract scholar of Islam. I could have taken a, a qualification in Islamic studies, but this is uh, of no real value if you don't intend to do something with it. And sadly, I didn't. After I returned from Turkey to Dubai, uh, by Allah, I found myself working for uh, some very excellent people. And uh, the person who was my boss became one of my great friends and still is to this day. In the evening after work we would discuss or maybe we would go out for some dinner, uh, maybe in a little bit during the office also. And he would help me to uh, study the right things and 
talk to the right people, answer some of my questions as best he could. But still he could see my objections were all to do with logic. All of these questions about custom and practice, all of these things that were born out of my secular upbringing. I'd never really been a Christian, uh, I'd just been uh, some sort of atheist or agnostic. I continued to ask questions and there were questions he couldn't necessarily answer himself. Fortunately, uh, at some, after some time, I think it was maybe after at least a year, uh, some men came into his orbit, some, some businessmen, some European Muslims, who were trying to uh, start a great project. Their project, particularly at that time, was the wish, the, the great desire to reintroduce the Islamic gold dinar, so the currency of the Muslims. This seems like, uh, even now, seems like a, an awfully big desire and a huge goal. And it was then, it remains so. But he brought this to me and he said, hey, you're a finance man, what do you think of this? There's some European Muslims who are trying to bring uh, a practical aspect of Islam. The idea is that you cannot pay the zakah unless there is a gold dinar to pay it with. So you only have four pillars of Islam and you must find the other one by some proper means. So he said to me, what do you think of this idea? Of course, I learned all about Islam, I knew what he meant by these pillars, and I said, rubbish, it can't be done. There's no way that they can overcome the financial system of the Kafirs, and this will fail. And he said, well, why don't you come and tell them this? Well, I think I was in a bad mood, and I said, yes, yeah, sure, I'll tell them. And so he took us out, and I met these men. They were Spanish and Germans, spoke English very well, very educated, very wise, great scholars. They'd reverted to Islam 10, 20 more years before, and their knowledge was very great. Uh, these men are still doing great dawah all over the world. So we discussed. We went to this restaurant, and we talked and we talked. We started with that dinner, and I asked my questions. And for the first time, I started to get answers that I couldn't challenge. Uh, they weren't just answering my questions from a religious point of view, but they were also answering from a point of view of logic uh, and all the scientific sense that I th thought I had and I thought I had as my objections and arguing these points of religion and philosophy. And at one o'clock in the morning, and it was, a, it was a Wednesday night in the middle of the week, they said to me, so, do you have any more questions? And I said, no, I don't. I've run out of questions. So they said, now what? You're going to embrace Islam? What could I say? I could only say yes. So it was, they uh, invited me to come to their house on the following Friday, two days later. I came to their house, we prepared, they gave me some last um, lessons, some last advice, things I needed to know about the Salah, uh, about making wudu, ghusl. And we went to the uh, Grand Mosque in Jumeirah, where I said my shahada. And I immediately got a, a thousand big brothers all hugging me and delighted. And I'd never seen so many happy faces, never. No birthday party, no Christian gathering, no any other sort of gathering. So many pleased people, and they're all pleased for me. So that's my story. I hope it doesn't bore you too much. Uh, I think I just have one thing I want to say. Those of you that are watching, that were born Muslims, alhamdulillah, you were blessed. And I just hope that you treasure it, and you treat it as you should, as a gift that you were given at birth something very wonderful. If you're watching and you already are a Muslim, but you are a revert, like me, then Mabruk, congratulations. Also, alhamdulillah, always alhamdulillah. I hope your story was something wonderful for you, whether it was a sudden discovery or a slow and torturous argumentative path like mine. Whatever it was, I hope it brought you to the right place. If you're not a Muslim, then I have something else to say to you. That is, look at me now, some ugly old man, but I'm very happy, happier than I've ever been, more satisfied than I've ever been. All the doubts and fears, all the de desires and longing for the wrong things, material things, stupid things, things that just belong to this life, that no matter what I collected, after 70, 80, 90 years, if I'm lucky, I would have to give them all up. I've swapped that for something permanent. I'm not going to lecture you, you know, if you don't want to listen to it, you don't have to listen. Just see what I have on my face. I'm happy. You could be happy too. This is something you should consider. I hope you will.